Here is a question that I received. The individual wanted to know why the measurement of the tread won't always represent the depth of the tread that they refer to in the building code. So for example, for most residential stairs, they have a 10 inch minimum depth. And to calculate the depth of the individual treads, all you need to do is measure the stairway and divide it up into the amount of steps that you have. Here we have one, one, two, three, four, five, six steps. And if we divide that into the length, we're going to get six 10 inch steps. Over here, we're going to have six 12 inch steps. So we're going to be using the same tread, 12 inch tread over here, 12 inch tread over here, except the 10 inch tread is going to have a two inch nosing. Now, most building codes have a maximum for the nosing. I believe that's about an inch and a quarter. So this stairway wouldn't meet most local building codes. However, this one will because we have a 12 inch tread. The minimum is 10 inches. And in this example here, the width of the lumber that is 12 inches actually represents the length of the individual tread depth on the stairway. And this is the measurement you're going to use for your building codes. So there will be times when the depth of the tread is going to be the same as the lumber used. Over here it works, over here it doesn't. Hopefully that makes sense. If it doesn't, let's go ahead and take a look at how we can use a framing square to calculate the depth of the tread for the building codes. Now the building codes often refer to the farthest protrusion forward on each one of the steps. So if we just take our framing square and we lay it on top of a level step like we did here, then all we need to do is measure that length. However, on the other side, we're going to have something a little different because when we shove the framing square up against the farthest protruding section of the step above and then measure the distance on the lower section, we're going to end up with a 10 inch tread depth measurement. And in this example, the width of the lumber will not represent the tread depth you're going to use as the measurement for your building codes. So if we take the farthest projecting step at the bottom and then go to the farthest projecting step at the top and then draw a vertical line on a level surface like we did here, we're going to come up with 50 inches. 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 10 inch steps. And if I did my job correctly, this should make sense to most of you. However, if it doesn't, feel free to leave your questions in the comment area and I will try to answer them as soon as possible. Here is another video in our large building series. In this video, I will provide you with two different ways to build the gable walls. However, the most common is going to be a flat wall, the same height all the way around the perimeter of the building. And that's going to be more for a convenience. It's going to be easier to build than building this over here. And don't forget that your engineered roof trusses are usually a system that is designed with a plan. And that plan will usually have installation instructions or examples, details on how to assemble the roof. And that system might not require a wall like this. So let's go ahead and take a look at the bottom of the foundation. We will not have any additional concrete footings in here. Another plus for a truss roof, plus the fact that they are usually easy to install. And with our balloon framed rake wall here, I will also provide you with two different ways to finish off the corners here for the roof rafters. And of course, I will provide you with the most common method along with something a little more tricky over here where we're going to notch the rafter into the wall framing and then our lookouts will be sitting in these notches here and i don't know if this is a method that would be approved by your engineer because we're really cutting a lot out of the framing plate there and our building is 30 foot by 60 foot with a door over here and a large opening over here for our garage door and if you notice, I'm also going to provide you with two different ways to frame the header here. And I went ahead and used a 4x4 post there. The 4x4 post was part of my original design, thinking that I would need to install hold downs at each end. So I have a 4x4 here and a 4x4 here. And you might need to add more anchor bolts and hold downs 
to provide additional lateral support for the front wall here. And the other method here would be stopping the header at a king stud. And since the framing plates do not go through, we're going to need to install a strap. And you might want to move the strap over a little bit so that it is not in the way of the roof truss. Next up, let's go ahead and install our roof trusses. We will have a gable roof truss at this end of the building. And don't get confused, you don't need to frame it the same way here. Like I said, you can have a flat wall with a gable truss at each end to make your job a little easier. So we're going to have the top of the gable truss notched for our lookouts or 2x4s that will be supporting the fascia board. And let's go ahead and take a look at the strap I was talking about. You just want to move it over a little bit so that the roof truss is not sitting on top of it. And this might not be the case all the time. If you have a large strap, then the strap is going to take priority over the roof truss. And our eave blocks here and our block here for the fascia board. And basically the lookouts are gonna provide us with enough structural support because this block will not be providing us with much. And this is another common method for framing with roof trusses. And we will need to install some support backing. These two by fours will prevent the bottom of the trusses from moving. And in our example here, we will be installing two of them, basically spanned about one third of the way. The building is 30 foot wide. And if we divided that by three, we would have about a 10 foot space between the outside walls and each one of the support braces. And again, your roof trust manufacturing company will provide you with all of the necessary information you need to assemble the roof. And they're going to be the ones who will provide you with any additional information you need that might not be on their plans. Let's go ahead and install the fascia board. You can see here where the lookouts are going to be installed. And let's go ahead and take a quick tour of this. For those of you who have not seen any of my videos, and of course a view of the ridge block here for the fascia board. If you notice, the block in the center is not even at the top or flush with the top. It's down a little bit the edges of the block will be even or flush with the fascia board and the truss. So make sure that you pay attention to the assembly of these blocks here so that you don't end up with a bump up there in the sheathing. A view of the other side there. Let's go ahead and take a look at how we added this board. We're just simply going to add a board and nail it to the rake wall here. However, when we do that, we're not going to end up with a rafter that will be even with the outside edge of the wall. And this looks kind of funky sometimes. So only use this method here if that's going to be acceptable. And of course the lookouts here will attach to the lower top framing plate and will be notched in between the upper framing plate. And you can always have two top plates that run all the way through and then some blocks like this that would be acting as a third plate basically. Now let's go ahead and head over to the other side. Take a look at how we notched this rafter into the wall framing so that it would be even with the outside edge of the wall. And like I said, this usually becomes a problem when you're looking at the bottom of the eave. So something like this seems to look more normal than the other side of the building, especially to those of you who are in the business. So after we install our roof sheathing, this is what the bottom of it would look like. And of course, since it is a gable roof, it's going to be easier to install the roofing because you're not going to have as many cuts as you would on a hip roof. And of course, here is the detail I'm talking about where this kind of looks a little goofy. You might have stucco or siding that's going to go up here and create some type of an odd looking corner. And again, if it's not that big of a deal and you need to build a large rake wall instead of using a gable roof truss, then I would say go for it. Use that method. And you might need a block here in the wall to nail the bottom truss cord spacer to. And if you have it up against a wall framing stud, you will be able to attach it to the framing stud and the block and attach the block to the framing studs on each side. 
And if you notice, we do not have any drywall backing. You can always attach this to the drywall backing if you're going to be installing drywall in your garage. Front view of the building. Let's go ahead and take a look at the bottom here. And one of the biggest problems you're going to have with this roof is that you won't have the height that you will in our previous examples if you need it. So we have a seven foot opening, seven foot off of the floor. And if you're gonna be parking large equipment in your garage, this might not work. And you're gonna to have to forget about this design here. This design right here should work fine for vehicles like a car or a truck and storage, but you're not gonna be able to park a large tractor in something like this if that's what you need this garage for. And thanks for watching. Don't forget to check out some of our other videos on YouTube. And if you can't find the videos on YouTube, make sure that you visit our website to find a complete organized list of all of the videos we've made so far.